All right, guys, our next guest is one of the biggest and most successful managers in the sport with clients such as Justin Gaethje, Henry Cejudo, Kamara Usman, Kayla Harrison, Khabib Nurmagomedov, Islam Makhachev, and the list goes on. The head of dominance MMA management, the one, the only Ali Abdelaziz. Welcome officially for the very first time to Submission Radio. How are you, man? I'm good, my man. Thank you for having me on. We're Thank actually, you. we're really glad that you're on with us, man. I think a couple of years ago, we wouldn't have thought this would be possible, but things have a funny way of working out, man. Shout out to yourself, obviously, Daniela as well, to, um, to set this up. Always good to move in a positive uh, sort of direction. I, be honest, are you as surprised as we are, man? No, no, man. Listen, at the end of the day, like, you know, when you do a good job and you'll be fair to everyone and, you know, time comes, you know, sometimes... We all catch feelings and certain things said, and but at the end of the day, you know, we move on. Uh, you guys, uh, part of the sport to be bigger, and, and I'm part of the sport too. And, and let's be positive and, and try to make things, uh, you know, better for everyone. You know, and uh, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a rough sport. You know, and sometimes, you know, uh, people get uh, their feelings hurt. Uh, I'm, I'm one of them. I got you, man. I got you. Look, at the end of the day, a lot of respect. Uh, that we have a lot of respect for you. Always have, man. So this is good, man. 2024, new beginning. Guys, what, what, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. This, this, I love that. Fridge door opens. It's going to be Sorry. <laughs> no worries, man. No worries, man. I thought All you good. left for a second. I thought you are like, no, nah, I've changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. All right. Fr fridge is closed. We're all good. All right. I wanted to kick this off, man. Obviously, you've been an MMA, MMA manager forever, man. You've seen so many sort of, um, you've seen so many things in the sport. And uh, there's a really, really good documentary out at the moment uh, on Fight Pass it's called Fight Inc. Have you had a chance to watch it yet? No. So it gives phenomenal access behind the scenes. And I want to kick it off with this. There's a funny moment where, uh, it, this is going back a while now, quite a few months ago, where uh, Dana and the matchmakers, they're talking about, they're having like a matchmakers meeting. They're talking about like Usman, Shavkat, and then um, I think it was Mick Maynard or someone's like, Ali's next door. He's in the kitchen. And so Dana's like, I'll get him right now. He runs over next door. And then there's you and Habib. You guys are having lunch or something. And then there's basically like almost a matchmaking meeting. I don't know if it's a negotiation, but it's just like right there. Day one, uh, Usman Shavkat, you're like, look, I think Usman Wonderboy, Habib sort of chiming in. Do you remember that moment? It was a hilarious sort of yeah, yeah. behind the I scenes moment. Clip. I haven't seen the documentary, but I did see that clip. I, I think that was, uh, <coughs> it was Hunter, <coughs> sorry, guys. That's okay. Okay. It was Hunter Campbell. Sorry. He told the Dana Ali next door. Yeah. And, uh, <coughs> And then I ambushed me in the kitchen. Yeah, it seemed then, like it. And it was, uh, we, we were just stopping by to say hello to Dana. Every time Habib in town, come by and they talk and stuff. Yeah, they ambushed me and, um, and you know, Dana's the best at doing this. And <laughs> it's his job to make a big fight and this is a big fight. Mm. And, uh, but right after that, Kamaru went to Fakamza. Mm. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. After that, yeah. Kamaru's afraid of no one fight anyone. Doesn't really matter who, when, where. If, if the number is right, you know, Kamaru's always in. Yeah, before we um sort of talk a little bit about Kamaru, I gotta ask, man, like in terms of Habib, I know he's a he's an absolute legend in the sport, but <laughs> I guess people don't really realize how good of a mind Khabib might have for like matchmaking and business. I mean, do you recall any other times where Khabib sort of given any good advice regarding business or sort of matchmaking or sort of those kinds of decisions that people may not realize? Khabib is actually a very intelligent, very smart, very sharp uh, individual. Mm. But also Khabib is one of those guys like if you are, you are new, if you are in UFC, you have to fight anybody, anytime, anywhere. He, his mindset, his team, he give, even his guys coming up, he give all his guys tough fights, you know, and I argue with him sometimes because <laughs> yeah. you have to put guys slowly, but he's like, listen, if they want to be in the UFC or big promotions, they have to be tested outside. And uh, and uh, and, uh, and this is his mindset, man. If you want to be a fighter, uh, you only world champion mindset. You have to beat anybody everywhere now. Everybody picking, choosing fight. And this is not what his mentality is. That's not what Kamaru was from mentality is. Mm. Uh, these guys, they fight anybody. They don't really care. 
because they think they believe they're the best. You have to believe you're the best to be in this business, to be number one. You have to believe you can beat anybody. 100% man I was gonna ask you also just I know like all a lot of this uh behind the scenes stuff is from ages ago like we already had Jack Della and Kevin Holland this documentary is obviously quite a while behind but just you mentioned Usman ended up fighting Hamza what what is the latest update as far as Kamara Usman as far as like who he might fight next and sort of time Kamara goes? you know Kamara's recovering from, uh, from injuries he's, he's healing up you know mm. uh, you know just at the end of the day I think Kamara he have the right to kind of do whatever he wants right now in his career. The guy is an absolute legend, you know, greatest welterweight of all the time. He's mountain rush for sure, best the greatest ever. Um, the guy never turned down a fight. He always game to fight anybody. But you know, he's now 36. He, he you know, he's a gunslinger. Fought Hamzat on 10 days notice. He was in a fashion show in Italy. We called him. He come 10 days notice. Uh, Kamaru is one of a kind, man. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's when you come down to it, he's one of the greatest ever uh, because he afraid of no one, fought everyone, and uh, he accomplished a lot. And right now, we just, just uh, probably end of the year, he will come back uh, and he have, you know, two fights left and see what he's going to do. Where, where would you rather see him, 170 or 185 right now? Because like, like you said, he's obviously a legend at 170, one of the best to ever do it. Would you like to see him do the middleweight thing and come back a middleweight for his next fight at the end of the year? Kamaru walk around it, it, it is almost the same as some of the lightweights. He's not this big. He's just very muscular. Mm. But uh, he's not. This, Kamaru doesn't really pass. He's 186, 190 at max. Mm. Sometime, you know, when he's training, you know. Uh, I would like to see Matt Walter wait, you know, uh, this is my opinion, but at the end of the day, he, he, he reserves the right to do whatever he wants. Yeah, you know? okay. It'll be interesting to see what he chooses because, um, yeah, there's there's just a lot of great fights at 170, but also welterweight might be, it'll be interesting to see the landscape and like who's champion and stuff because obviously you got your guy, Bilal Muhammad, he's scheduled to fight Leon Edwards at UFC 3 or 4 next month. And like from, mm-hmm. from a behind the scenes perspective, just take us into like what some of the work that you've put in and how challenging it's been to sort of like get this fight over the line. Because obviously Bilal, he's been demanding this title shot for such a long time. He's got a massive streak, he's had a lot of success in the division. And it just seems like, you know, there was kind of like other guys getting the title shots first. Are you sort of relieved that like finally this title shot is here and only about a month away? Listen, sometime you see Habib, he has to fight nine fight before he get a title shot, right? Mm. And Islam, 10 fight, you know, but when they get there, they become most dominant fighters ever, right? At the end of the day, it's like, uh, this guy's like, like maybe like wine, they, you know, they need this experience before become the championship. When, when, the, when, when a championship opportunity come, they're ready. And I think Valal is ready. He paid his dues. And I think uh, in July, he's going to go to England. He's going to do a biggest upset in UFC history. And he's going to beat Leon Edward and he's going to become the champion. That's what my opinion, you know. I believe Magomed Ankala have become the champion this year. I believe Kayla Harrison will become the champion this year. I believe Bella can become the champion this year too. I believe these three people will be champions. And I believe Omar Nurmagomedov will become a champion. Oh my God, dude, what a crazy year. It's going to be so exciting. Got to ask, like, it does make it interesting though, right? Because if Bilal wins, I know Islam very much wants to move up and get another belt and become the champ champ. From a manager's perspective, how do you sort of navigate a situation like that between both of your clients? I mean, is it a, it's a good problem to have, right? Or is it a bit of a pain in the ass because, you know, obviously you love both guys and you want both guys to do well. How do you manage that situation? Listen, I got Henry Sahuru fought Marlon Marais for a UFC title. Mm. They both my guys. fought Habib for a UFC title. Yeah. Both my guys. Gil- Gilbert and Kamaru as well. Gilbert and Kamaru. And at the end of the day, I just uh, I stay very fair. Doesn't matter how close I am, how much I love you. I give everybody the same attention. The, you know, there's nobody closer to me than Habib, and I was being able to be stay very fair between him and Justin. You know, and uh, this is why you know normally when guys have each other fight, one of the guys leave the management, right? But for me, it never happened because I'm a man and I know how to treat other men. And um, it's not about me; it's about them. It is two people who work all their life to become champions. If they decide they want to fight each other, they can go ahead. You know, I don't think. Islam and Bilal will fight each other, but 
if they choose to, I'll be right in the middle and best man might win and, and that's about it. Mm. It's their legacy, it's not my legacy. Javier, Javier Mendes did mention that. He said, you know, if Bilal wins, it might be a different story. If Leon Edwards does keep the championship, like Javier Mendes told us he'd love to see Islam move up to 170. How do you feel if Leon Edwards is still champion after UFC 304, do you want to see Islam fight for that belt next or is it still lightweight in your opinion? I think Islam, if anybody deserves it for second title, I think it's Islam, you see Herrera fight for second title. Mm. But I'm not seeing Islam give him a shot two times for a title. If anybody deserves it, it's it's 100%. It's, uh, it's Islam. At the end of the day, this is a business, and uh, and you know Islam will fight anybody. It doesn't matter. I don't want people to think Islam is ducking people. He already beat everybody. He already beat Oliveira. He beat Valnowski. He beat Dustin. He beat Arman. He beat all these guys. And at the end of the day, he's not shy from any challenge. I think I believe he's the greatest fighter in UFC today. He's the pound for pound number one. No, it's not. It's not even close second, honestly. Nobody even close second. And uh, the way he beat people, the way he dominated people, the way he finishes people, who does that? Nobody. And he earned the right now to relax and enjoy his family and and uh, enjoy, have a good time. You know, it's no stress. Mm. I was going to say, like, obviously, welterweight something that he's been talking about for quite a while. I know, like, the focus has always been the fight in front. You know, we just had dust. And the, the, the dust has literally just settled from, from that fight. But... Over the last however many months or even the last year or so, even when Islam was talking about it last year around the time of the Volkanovsky fight, have you gauged the UFC's interest at all in, in Islam moving up sort of eventually one day? Have they said anything to you about like, oh, yeah, we, we could see him moving up and sort of, you know, going for that double champ champ? They know. They know he's going he's gonna to go up. He's mm. coming. coming. It's just a, Are they open a to question. it? Do they like the idea? Yeah, it's, it's coming. If Islam decides to go up, he's going to go up. You know, of course, we all have to talk and we always seem to be on the same page, you know. Islam right now, honestly, I don't even want him to think about fighting. I want him really to enjoy himself and and, and cherish his work. He just uh, went to a war who was a really, really tough opponent. Um, and uh, just uh, sometimes for a fighter, I don't like to bum brush him after. Be like, oh, you have a fight. When a fighter knows they have a fight, automatically... They start thinking about the fight. Even there's no contract, there's no bad agreement or nothing. But I take the fun from life from them. Because when you in camp, you in camp. Like, they already put them immediately in camp. They're not really in camp. But mentally, they start thinking about this one guy every day. And I think Islam right now, he doesn't need to do that. Mm. I'd love to know your perspective on this, Ali. Obviously, Armin, you know, he wants the next title shot. But from your perspective, do you think he made a mistake by not accepting that short notice? title fight against Islam, uh, the Dustin ended up getting a 302? No, I, I think, listen, at the end of the day, like, you don't know what he went through through camp. You don't know is the weight cut. Sometimes it's not easy to cut weight back to back like that, especially you guys like who built like him, you know? But at the end of the day, I always say to guys, never say no to title shot. But he banked on he's getting title fight next, and maybe he's going to get it, maybe he's not, you know? Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think he'll be next, you know, but you never know, man. The sport is crazy. You never know what's going on. Tony Ferguson, right? He's supposed to fight Habib. He mm. so much in and out. They never fought, you know, and he never fought for the championship. You know, a lot of things happen. It's a wild sport. Crazy things can happen, you know. Armand is a good fighter, and if that's the UFC want, and that's what Islam want, that's who's going to be next. Mm. One thing that Islam was talking about not that long ago is he would be open to fighting a Conor McGregor fight, you know, like maybe towards the end of the year. How realistic do you think that would be? Obviously, like, Conor's got Chandler. There's a lot of things that would have to happen. But I wonder, like, from a managerial perspective, how realistic and how important of a fight would that be or would that not be for, for Islam, for his career? Like, like I told you a couple of seconds ago, it's a crazy sport. Yeah. Conor might go there, knock out Chandler, first round. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and after that, he's one of the biggest stars in the sport, like him or hate him, or, you know, he is. And he tells the UFC, hey, I want a title shot, Islam want a title shot. That can be your next title shot. Islam is going to say no. Now he's not going to say no to this fight. Mm. It's a big fight. It's a big name. It's a lot, lot more money. You know, and this, at the end of the day, I, 
people fight for legacy, but if they're not getting paid, they're not going to fight. It's mm-hmm. about making money. This is what it is. I always think back to like Habib, where like Habib is, he, he's one of the biggest stars the sport has ever seen, right? And obviously he carved his legacy so long before the Connor fight. But because because that Connor fight was so big, there was such a big buildup, still holds the record for pay-per-view buys. It helped him sort of become, you know, that next level star. Do you feel like that would be like something that could happen with Islam, where it just kind of like, <laughs> it highlights all those achievements by bringing such a big spotlight on him? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, the guy, he's have massive star. You know, I think he's a piece of shit, but <laughs> he is a massive star. You can't take this away from him. With the history with Habib and with him, with Islam, it will be all over again. You know, it will be all over again and it will be one of the biggest fights you can make today. Mm. You know, and, uh, and, uh, one thing I know about Dana White, he likes money. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> and he likes business. And this is a, that's why the UFC is, is so big right now. You have Dana, you have Hunter, you have Sean, you have Mick. They are great minds and they put on the biggest fight. They can sell the most pay per views. Why not? Just quickly before you get in, you know, it would be a, a crazy visual just as we're talking, I'm imagining it. Is if, if, you know, this is obviously fantasy matchmaking, but if you got Islam and Connor, but then you got Habib in, in Islam's corner, I just feel like that would be a wild visual to see. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the boys are back, the team's back. I just think that would be wild. Absolutely. Listen, it's very possible. But, you know, Connor have to get out the bottle and he have to leave the drugs alone and, and focus. And he ha- he's definitely, the guy was a two-division champion. I'm not, he has talent, you know? But is the hard work now is there or not there? And you have to ask him this question. Mm. By the way, did you get any calls from the UFC regarding UFC 303 when the press conference was canceled? Like, were they seeing if any of your guys were available just in case this fight didn't come together? No, I didn't get no call. Because I don't think this fight was ever cancelled. I don't. Mm. I don't think. I don't think it was ever cancelled. But I think around that time, um, it was reported that the UFC was sort of like, okay, let's just gauge people's interest. Let's just see who's available, just in case, just in case something was happening. And I know Kayla Harrison, <laughs> your client, was like, someone asked her on Twitter, like, if she would step in, and she's like, yep, which is a pretty crazy thing for her as well. Yeah, I think somebody asked about the Amanda Nunes. Uh, she'll fight Amanda Nunes or somebody. But he was I like, would it. you step in at UFC 303 on like however many weeks notice to save the card kind of thing? And she was like, yep, I'd do it. Which would be crazy given how big she is and how much time she would need for that weight cut. Yeah, now she's a two-time Olympic champion. She's a professional, mm. you know. I believe when her career starts, mm. that she's going to be the greatest female fighter ever. I think she's dominant. I think, uh, you know, she got to beat the two, mm. the two champion fight, the, the champion fight in Juliana. She, she's going to beat the winner and uh, hopefully Amanda Nunes, you know, you have to understand Amanda Nunes have did everything. She retired because Kayla was coming to the UFC, number one. She left the ATT uh, because Kayla was training there, right? Um, she turned on the people who really helped her, like Dan Lambert and uh, Conan and everybody who helped her because Kayla was getting more attention and she grown and she knew they were going to have to fight, right? Amanda Nunes, her biggest nightmare in her, it was Kayla. And this is why she, she, she retired. She had a lot of pride in her. She retired because Kayla Harrison. And now she said she want to come back. I don't think she ever come back, you know, but if you come back, that'll be amazing. She, they, you know, she, she never, she, she, she trained a couple of times and uh, whatever happened in the training room happened. And she never wants to train with Kayla again. She never wants to spar with Kayla again. She starts training by herself, away from the team. Every time Kayla comes to the gym, she left, you know. And uh, she, ATT really created who she is, and she turned she turned on her because she thought Kayla's coming. And you know what? And she was coming. She was right. Kayla was coming. But she was the champion. She was the, the, the jewel of the gym. But her insecurity and uh, uncertain about beating Kayla allowed her to leave the gym. Damn it. So you reckon Kayla and, and Amanda, you reckon there's just not much chance that that's ever going to happen? I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, I think Amanda, she missed the attention. Uh, and I think enough pressure of me and you talked about it. All the media talked about it. It might, it might tickle her ego a little bit for her to come back. But it doesn't matter. If she want to come back, she can come back. She's going to take this last and go back to retirement. 
it'll be, it, I'm fascinated by Kayla Harrison's career, right? Because obviously she's done so much good work um, in the PFL, but we saw even like with say Ronda Rousey, right? It wasn't until she got into the UFC that like, you know, all that marketing sort of like helped her become such a massive star. What are you expecting in terms of like Kayla's ceiling and star power now that she's in the UFC and she's got obviously the UFC marketing machine behind her? Honestly, like Ronda's cool, but I think Kayla's is a 4.0 compared to Ronda, right? It's not even the same skills. It's not the same work. I think it's not the same heart. She's a much better fighter than Ronda was she will ever be, right? This is my humble opinion. Not taking anything away from Ronda. She's a legend. But Kayla's prime Kayla, prime Ronda, Kayla who killed Ronda in the fight. This is my opinion. Um, uh, Kayla will be the biggest female star in history. I'm telling you. Ronda catch a lot of stuff because her pressure is plenty, but Ronda cannot fight like a Kayla can. You understand? Kayla will never quit. Kayla will, you know, she was always in a fight, even tough fights, right? She fought a whole bunch of girls on steroids and she beat all of them, you know? But in reality, it's just a matter of time. A matter of time, like having the Habib, you know, nobody want to fight him. Having the Islam Makhachev, and now they become the pound for pound king. You have to understand the three guys, the last three guys, who's the pound for pound number one? Kamaru Usman. We pick him fight in hotel lobby to get him fights. He become the pound for pound number one. Khabib, we press him, going to press conference, arguing with people to fight him. people. Khabib become the pound for pound. Islam, nobody want to fight him. He become the pound for pound. Kayla, same, same thing, same thing, same thing, right? And uh, and I just think she's this type of fighter. She's the type of fighter who people kind of going to avoid her, but they're going to run out of a uh, road and they're going to have to face her one day. Hmm. It's it's who, who would you like to see for her next? I know uh, she obviously had that massive win with over Holly. It wasn't that long ago. W- what do you think could be next for her? My Rob or Aljamain Sterling. For Kayla Harrison, yeah, I I think I think it's it's very competitive fight. It's not fair. It's not honestly if, because if none of these girls want to fight her, let's fight somebody at, at one thirty five. You know, let's fight some you know a raw fund. But I think her wrestling is too good for raw fund. It's not even a fair fight. Or maybe this Brazilian guy, what's his name, uh, former champion. You know, I, I think she will smash all these guys honestly because none of these females they're gonna want to fight her especially after what she did to Holly. And I think let's make her move some, fight some men. And I believe she can win, beat all those guys I just mentioned. Has it been difficult getting her opponents? Like, I don't know if it's before the Holly fight or since the Holly fight, but have you, is it hard for you guys sort of behind the scenes getting people to accept? Yeah, the, the UFC offered hundreds of thousands of dollars for a female fighter to accept the fight and nobody won. Wow. But they're not going to have no choice that UFC going to have to strip them from the title or something. Mm. You know, but listen, they got making Hunter Campbell work on this. They will get, they will get a fight. They will get a fight. Mm. But nobody want to fight her. That's why I said, let's let's go for it. Al Jermaine or Marab or somebody. You know, I gotta ask a little bit, sort of on a side note, but um, obviously, like, there's a lot of stuff happening with like PFL and Bellator. Obviously, now Bellator, uh, PFL since they bought Bellator, but like, there's been a little bit of like displeasure from some of the fighters. We saw Gay Gad Masasi. You know, he's been released from his contract. But Kayla Harrison even sort of like caught some strays. Like there were some comments made regarding her sort of being like Kevin Durant. I wonder what your thoughts were on that. And just in general, like some of the stuff that's going on with PFL and how um, it's just, it just seems to be sort of troubling times since the, the merger. One thing I can tell you. Mm. Kayla is a seven-figure fighter. Every time she fought in PFL, she got paid. Even... When she left, she had one fight left on her contract. She got paid for this fight. They pay her. And even she did not fight. Listen, Kevin Durant is not a bad player. <laughs> he made millions and millions of dollars and won some championship. You know, listen, sometimes people say stuff. Don, Don is not a bad guy. I like Don a lot. Yeah. He's a great guy. You have Mike Hogan. You have Ray Suffo. You have Pete Murray. Honestly, I, I never have problem with these guys. They always, you know, we agree and disagree on things, you know. But the honorable man, the honor of the contract, Musasi is team just idiots. Because Musasi, he have a guarantee contract. 
But one of the things in his contract, if you talk about the contract, they can cancel the contract. And he did that. That's why, like, you cannot have amateur represent you. You have, you have to have people around who are smart people. Musasi is a legend. Uh, one of my favorite fighters, actually, of all the time. Honestly, mm-hmm. I like him a lot. But who advised him to go on business? Get down behind a closed door. If even 1% chance. But when there's no chance, you talk about it. Mm. Right? Have your manager talk about it. Have your, your manager get paid a lot of money to be the bad guy. You're the good guy. Why you put your fighter in front of the gun? And guess who lost the fighter, not the manager. And I think people got to be careful who represents you out there because people have been doing this for 20 years. Right? I'm always going to put myself in front of the gun for my guys because this is what I do. This is what they pay me for. You understand? Uh, Kayla, you know, situation was done. I think Don respect Kayla very much. I think Kayla respect Don also. It's a little bit tough love sometimes, but I think it's no hard feeling. PFL, they're great people. Kayla's an awesome human being. And uh, PFL did a lot for Kayla. Did a lot for a lot of fighters. Uh, and I have nothing bad to say about them. And I will never do. Other people... Ali. Maybe soon I'm going to talk bad about them, but not now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, someone that we uh, we would never say a bad thing about and someone someone that we only have good things to say about is obviously our good friends at Manscaped who take care of your downstairs section, your, you know, you call them whatever you want to call them, your knee knockers, your golden nuggets, your thigh slappers, whatever you want. Good friends at Manscaped refer to them simply as the boys. Not every man has children, but everyone is responsible for their two boys below their waist. And when the little guys have a bit more hair than they need and they need a fresh, funky haircut, trust Manscaped for all your grooming dreams. And hey, every man knows how scary it can be and how scary it gets when going in for that close shave below the waist. That's why we trust Manscaped for all our sensitive areas. Introducing the Lawn Mower family with the Lawn Mower 3.0 Plus, the 4.0 Pro and the 5.0 Ultra. Three ball trimmers. Each trimmer is equipped with the skin safe technology, LED spotlight, unique features for grooming needs such as the travel lock. They're all waterproof as well. How good is that? You take it on the go, you smash it out, you feel like a brand new man, silky smooth, downstairs, you're good to go. They've also got phenomenal other things and other products as well to keep you smelling A1 downstairs as well. 20% off with the code submission. Can't beat it. Isn't that right, Dennis? That's right, man. It's the best in the game. Support the show and support yourself. Use that code word submission today and get that 20% off and free shipping now. But Ali, I was going to ask you, you know, obviously you got so much experience in the in the field. You're one of the best man. And I noticed over the last few years, you would have noticed too, there's been a shift in terms of fighters making money outside of just fighting, you know, whether it's from YouTube, podcasts, OnlyFans, or even promotions like BKFC or Karate Combat giving good paydays, or even see there's some people doing some boxing. As a manager, what do you think is the biggest difference you've noticed in the last few years in terms of opportunities to make money for fighters? And maybe even some opportunities that people are just completely ignoring and not paying any attention to. And how, how, do, you think, how, do, you, how do you think that affects the negotiating table as well? Now that there's all these, I like, honestly, I like that. I like the karate combat. Mm. You know, everybody else is gonna be in and out. They're not gonna be in business any longer because they're losing too much money. This is my opinion. You have the UFC, you have Bellator, you have PFL. This is the pillar of MMA right now. Everybody else, I hope they stay because we want more promotions. We want people to support this athlete, and a lot of promotion out there. You can't sign a fight, guys. One of the my biggest problem is promoter if you have a fighter under contract fighter need to fight three times a year ufc does that pfl Bellator. but if you keep in your fighter not fighting and under contract this is slavery this is like a hostage and uh, i hope every promoter out there who un- have fought under contract just give them fights give them fights or release them you know and i think it's one of the biggest problems in mma right now a lot of promotions having guys under contract and they don't give them fight. Negotiation is it's a case by case. Every guy is different. Every female is different. It's a case by case about who you are, what did you earn, what you didn't earn. But uh, I tell you, you know, Bellator buying PFL, I thought it was going to be bad, you know. 
so far it's not bad. Of course, some guys do not have a job and, you know, and it was sad. You know, a lot of people have to be cut, but also a lot of Bellator people, you know, didn't have a job also, you know. And this is the nature of life. Sometimes you, you earn what you do. You know, if a guy who's great fighters coming on winning streak, he you secured your career. Guys who have win and losses, you know, and as some of these guys I feel bad for because now they have no home. But also, it's not other credible promotion out there. They can go sign with them and be like, you know what? I'm going to pay you the same money or even a little bit less and give you fights. It's very dangerous out there. Dude, we really appreciate your time. As we wrap up, one last question. We have a lot of young, aspiring fighters who watch our show. Me and Casper have a lot of friends who fight. Got to ask you, man, as we finish up, obviously not everybody gets the opportunity to work with you. What is your number one piece of advice for any young fighter or sort of fighters starting out that are watching this program right now? What is one thing you think that they need to keep in mind as they're trying to sort of grow their career or even sort of build it into a career? Honestly, like, uh, like, like, region like Australia, I think Australia has so much great talent that has grown, grown, mm. it's so big in the May, right? If you're a young fighter, when you sign for a company like B UFC, they don't have development programs. PFL does, Bellator does. Don't go into UFC with three, four fights or five fights and you have a dream. Have a long-term dream. Go there. It's easy to go in the UFC, but it's very hard to stay in the UFC. But when you're being cut from the UFC, it's very hard to go back. Mm. That means when you go to the UFC, if a manager said, I'm going to get you there, I'm going to get you there, you want the manager who said, hey, let's not go to the UFC now. Let's start taking some smart fight outside, get the experience. Nine fight, 10 fight, 11 fight, 12 fight. Go to the UFC or Bellator or PFL, right? And uh, just don't rush. Take your time. If you go 25, 26, if you're 30, 32, okay, your time is running out, go for it. But if you're a young fighter, work on your skill set. Number one thing, be loyal to your coach. Find a good coach. Number one, coach, in my opinion, is more important than manager. A lot of people think manager is more important. I think coach is more important because the coach will tell you what's a good fight, what's a right fight. But also you have to be careful with coaches who are nervous, scared of every fight also. Mm. I think... Uh, be very important. I have guys like Javier Mendes in your corner, uh, Bell Cordero, many great coaches. I, I don't want to miss nobody. People be upset with me, you know, but there's so many great coaches, right? Um, fine guy like Frank Edgar, who just retired. He's going to open his own gym, right? Guys who've been in there, he understand the game, right? And just don't rush. Don't rush. Because I see many guys get rushed to the UFC. They're in and out, and we don't even know who they are. This is number one thing for young guys, and number one thing, be loyal. Mm. Be loyal to the people who help you, stick by you, stick with you to the end. Because when you're winning, you have no managers coming in, you have no coaches coming in, you have no people. But remember, remember who also brought you there. That's all I have to say for you guys. Sound advice, man. For anybody, any, any aspiring fighters out there looking for management, you know who to follow, man. Uh, Ali Abdelaziz Double Zero on Twitter, at Dominance MMA Management. One of the best, one of the biggest. Ali, thrilled to have you on, man. Thank you so much for joining us. I uh, really appreciate My the pleasure. chat, man. Fresh start, man. Thank you. Let's go. Thank you, guys.